So I love that because, and first of all, it made me learn about Song of the Lark, which was not a famous painting by Jules Breton uh, until well after his death, Eleanor Roosevelt made it a famous painting. Um, but I want to begin with you guys. You are two of my civic heroes because you've written your own life stories. You're the author of your own life stories. And I'm just wondering, what was you, I love that line Bill Murray used, uh, I too am a person, that art in inspired him to say to himself, I too am a person. What is your Song of the Lark moment? Is there a moment for both of you where creativity helped you find yourself? Tariq? Um, first of all, uh, that we all obviously got the turtleneck memo. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, the, for me, the, like art has always been uh, sort of, uh, you know, my, my voice. It has always been where, uh, you know, I've been able to sort of seek and find uh, refuge. Um, you know, I, when I was a young person, I, uh, you know, I experienced a fair amount of, of trauma. And, um, you know, uh, I was, uh, like, uh, in the middle of a, a fair amount of, of chaos. So art um, and the, the arts was always, you know, sort of where I was able to find peace. Um, so for me, I mean, you know, maybe I had a fire. I, you know, mistakenly burned down the house when I was, like, six years old. And I think somewhere around that time, I began to dive deeper into uh, yeah, the visual art. You know, that's when I, I, if I could trace back the point at which I became a visual artist, I, you know, when I started you know, drawing and painting and you know, really wanting to take it uh, seriously, um, is when I was around you know, six or seven, ar around the time of that fire. So that was sort of my you know, aha awakening moment. Um, and when I sort of began to understand the, the, the greater purpose that, you know, the arts could serve as a voice for the voiceless and, you know, again, as, as that refuge, you know. That fire you talked about, wasn't that also, didn't the cops come and, like, instead of dealing with the fire, arrest your brother? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, yeah, my, my brother was arrested. He got into, like, an altercation with... Uh, the the fire department and, and some of the some of the police the, the police who had come on on the scene so yeah my mother as I recall uh, she was out you know she wasn't she wasn't at home and we went to go and pick her up she was like at a doctor's visit or something and we went to go and pick her up like hey the house is burning down and um, you know as we you know, sort of came back to the house I remember seeing my brother uh, being taken taken a, a, away in handcuffs. He was, he's a little older than me. If I was, if I was six at the time, he was probably uh, 14 or so. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's powerful, powerful stuff for a six-year-old to go through. I could see how you need to, you need, you need some release after that, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, um, I think I mean, the sad truth is that's, you know, my, my lived experience is, you know, I'm, I'm no anomaly, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's pretty common for young people, especially in Philadelphia, um, not only doing it, you know, when I was a young person, but, you know, today, to experience, you know, just a, a comparable sort of level of, of tragedy and, and, and trauma. And, um, you know, we all need, you know, an outlet. Um, I was just lucky enough to, uh, to, to find one you know, in, in the arts. And um, again, and I, I came up during a time where, uh, you know, funding for arts and music um, education, uh, you know, in, in the school system and, you know, I mean, just it, outside the school system too, you know, the city and state funded programming was, uh, you know, it was just different. So I definitely had, you know, just different things that I could sort of latch on to that, um, you know, sadly a lot of young people now um, don't, Jane, what about you? Was there you you 
you are a force of nature in Philadelphia. You get the government to bend to your uh, will at, at, in a way that I've never seen, which is why I always try to. Five mayors. Five mayors. I always try to get, I always try to get her to run for mayor. Um, me too. <laughs> yeah, well, we might have to start a draft movement. Um, but you're also an artist. I mean, that's what you are. Uh, and where did that come from? Well, my mom was a really wonderful artist. Uh, my dad was a businessman. And so from the time I was young, art was really in the air. But, you know, I was sort of a, like a lonely, introverted kid and had my own world. I had a spy club. I was very active in my spy club. I, if we went around the room and people said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say, you know, I would want to be a detective, a spy, or an artist. Like, I, like teachers would go, what? Like, all the other. <laughs> I don't know, young people were like much more traditional. And so I, I, but I developed an internal world. And so through art, I found solace and comfort. Um, and so I painted a lot and I painted in college and then, then it was, so um, I loved it. And it's, it's college, in college I went to Stanford and like I was a double major fine art political science because I thought, oh, I'll be an artist. No, I'll go to law school, art, law, art, law. And then I moved down to LA and I saw these glorious murals. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I should do a mural. I don't know how to do a mural. I'll apply. So I applied to the LA mural program, and I, like, of course, drove them crazy, called them every day. And finally, after months, they're like, look, Jane Golden, we hope we never hear from you ever, um, <laughs> but you have the grant. It was like $300 to do a giant wall. Totally had never done it. And I did it with these colleagues I had just met, and uh, it was standing on that corner at Ocean Park in Maine that I, in talking to people about their lives and politics and neighborhood issues, people I never knew, I thought, you know what, art is like oxygen. It should be everywhere. It should be non-negotiable. And mural painting became my passion. Art is like oxygen. I love that. <laughs> yeah. um, Tariq, you once, you, you do this really fascinating thing, I think, with, with black identity. Um, you, you play with it, mm. I think, in many, in many forms. And, you once rapped that you were black as a Renaissance Harlemite, um, <laughs> uh, which I love. How did you come to that complicated place? Um, you know, again, uh, I think uh, I, I have the city of Philadelphia to, to thank for that, you know, like for, for the depth of, of my, my blackness and of my, you know, just of my humanity. You know, it comes uh, from just the rich culture that I was sort of immersed in uh, growing up here. And, um, you know, my name, the, the, the fact that I, that I go by Black Thought um, is something that I arrived at in art school as a painter uh, during, you know, when I was part of programs that didn't necessarily always have uh, uh, you know, a bunch of art supplies and, you know, you'd have to mix different colors together to arrive at, you know, a, a composite sort of color. Um, so, uh, you know, I learned how to make black, you know, from sort of mixing everything else together. And I just felt like that represented, you know, my identity as, a, as an artist, as a musician, and, you know, just sort of, you know, just a, an ad hoc, you know, a little bit of everything. Uh, that, that was part of my personality. Um, so that's how I, I arrived at, 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 at Black Thought. Um, but Jane and I go back to when I was about 12 years old or so. Um, first time, you know, my, my first run-in with the police department here in the city of Philadelphia personally, I was arrested um, in South Philly as a young graffiti artist. Um, you know, I, I was born in October 1973, which was, you know, maybe 12 weeks after hip-hop, you know, was born, if that. Mm. So we grew up around the same time. Uh, people ask me how, how I got into the hip-hop culture. I never got into it. It was just always, it was a given. It's part of, you know, again, who, who I am. And I grew up during a time where, um, you know, you, if you embrace any part of the culture, you had to embrace them all. So uh, you couldn't just, you know, rap or DJ or dance, you know, say I'm a b-boy or, you know, do graffiti. You had to sort of do it all. So when I was 9 and 10, 11 years old, I was all over the city of Philadelphia, running through the subway tunnels, hanging upside down from, you know, rooftops and, you know, just really, you know, taking the whole, you know, uh, 
graffiti and visual arts aspect of the hip hop culture uh, to full and complete seriousness because um, that's sort of what I aspire to, to, to be. Um, and that's, you know, what I knew. That's what I saw in films, you know, like, uh, you know, Wild Style and Beat Street when I was a young person. So yeah, I was doing graffiti when I was around 12 years old or so, and um, I got arrested. And uh, one of the terms of my, you know, I guess release was that I was sentenced to 150 or 200 hours of what they call scrub time. And that meant you had to go around the city and, you know, clean the graffiti off the walls. Um, and in that, uh, you know, I became part of the Philadelphia Anti-Graffiti Network, which was, you know, ironic because it didn't necessarily stop me from writing graffiti. <laughs> yeah. Now, what it, it didn't did... stop anyone. Yeah, no, but what it did was it, it, it placed many faces with, uh, you know, artists who I had only known by their names or, you know, what they, you know, tagged up on the wall. Um, and it just gave a different level of validity to, you know, the artisticity of, you know, aerosol art. And it gave me a different appreciation for it. And I definitely, though I didn't stop writing, I was definitely less likely to, you know, be as much of a vandal. You know, I was more, I became more concerned about, you know, composition and, you know, aesthetic. And, uh, and that's where Jane and I first met. I was 12 and, you know, it was, she was a, a young person in her own right, you know, having started a, a new program, so. It was, yeah, it was anti-graffiti was, I know, it's so, I feel so, like, lucky that I got to meet you and that we worked together. And, you know, anti-graffiti was this really sort of interesting grassroots program that put tons of kids to work. Like, think about Summers having 3,000 kids doing, creating art. And he, yeah, everybody, do you remember like people would come in, they'd take the amnesty yeah. pledge or they swore they'd never write on walls with Wilson Good. And then <laughs> you know, I have a picture of everyone looking totally miserable. And then, <laughs> and if you met me back in the day, it would have been me and like uh, Knife and uh, mm -hmm. Pez mm -hmm. and Surak and you know, Tran, Tran was my assistant. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> my former boss was like, this is your assistant, Tran. I was like, Tran. And it's like, he's totally a notorious graffiti writer. These are icons. Like icons. <laughs> and um, you know when, oh, I would, the city gave me an undercover police car. It, when you beeped the horn, the trunk flew open. It was so weird, it was so strange. And then beige paint and big brushes. I'm like, you can't run an art program this way. And so, but I would drive around and just introduce myself to people. People would go, <laughs> all these young guys would go, there comes a cop. And I'd say, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, so, and then, and they would start writing, um, Cool Jane around the city, and I'm like, look, I've never been cool ever in my life. So, but it's, a, it's so, but it was like so formative, and I could not, no way could I do the job in mural arts without those ten years of anti graffiti, meaning yeah. extraordinary artists like Tariq, but a ton of extraordinary, like so many incredible block type captains, community leaders, and you start to realize how art can be put to work for the greater good and how you work in communities that are, it's not your home. And you have to go in with the utmost respect and consideration and far more questions and no assumptions and value, truly value the authorship of everyone around the city. Yeah, um, yeah. So thank you, Tariq, for um, early inspiration. <laughs> That's beautiful. And it also, we also should say that for its time, uh, an the Anti-Graffiti Network was really, in we, we should give props to Wilson Good for, for this, what was an innovative program at the time, right? I mean, Wilson Good now is remembered for this thing, the move bombing, that yeah. is still yeah. this trauma that I don't think the city has no. recovered from. And I know it's, it's informed a lot of your art. You were Absolutely. how old at the time? You were... Yeah, I was uh, like a 11 or uh, maybe 12. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, but like this was sort of revolutionary, like to, to, um, uh, to, to unleash someone like you to find the, and give freedom to find the self-expression in kids like Tariq. It's, it's a model that I don't think we touch on enough. It was believing in young people. It was the seat of power was open to everyone. And that was just a different way of thinking about it. And now people always say, Graffiti is on the rise. We don't know what to do about graffiti. Look, you can give twenty million dollars to white out graffiti. Okay, I believe investing in young people is the way to go, and I think that's what we. Sh I think you can do both, right? It doesn't have to be an either or proposition. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, right, good. No, that's right. right. You, can, you can protect private property and also protect Investment. free self-expression. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. There's so much genius in our city that goes unrecognized. You, you cited it about the lack of opportunity. Yeah. It's not a fair world, right? So how do we level the playing field? That's right, that's right. There, I want to talk to you guys about your artistic influences um, because uh, uh, Tariq, I think there's some really fascinating, I know that in addition to Jane, you had mentors like Sonia Sanchez. Um, yeah. And also you got into Fela, uh, which uh, I want to talk to you about. So oh, talk yeah. about how you, how you got, uh, especially musically, to where you are. Um, well, you know, I, uh, uh, again, in the Anti-Graffiti Network and back in those days, what, one thing we would do um, as graph artists is we would all roll around with, uh, you know, a black book, a sketchbook of sorts, but, you know, a binded sort of black book. And in that, you would do, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you, you would illustrate your ideas before you, you know, took them to scale. So you could do like, you know, a piece and, you know, you do it in your book and say, I'm going to do this on this wall at this time or, uh, you know, it was sort of uh, where, where, where you ideated um, the, the, literally the, the drawing board. Um, but it, it also served, those books served as almost, a, you know, like a brotherhood of the traveling pants in a way, in that you would meet someone who, you know, you had a mutual respect for or, you know, someone who you were a fan of and you would ask them to tag in your book or you would exchange books sometimes. And um, rolling around with those sketchbooks, uh, you know, and those books full of graph is what really brought me to take, uh, you know, considering admission into uh, an art school uh, seriously. So I started, you know, pursuing, you know, in arts education. I started, you know, taking classes on the weekend at community college. I, you know, started taking classes on Saturday at uh, Fleischer Art Memorial down in South Philly. And, um, and that took me to, you know, the applying to schools like the High School for Creative and Performing Arts, uh, where, you know, I wound up, uh, you know, as, as a, a freshman in high school and starting, you know, this band. Um, Again, I was, you know, just inspired by my surroundings and, and my peers and what, you know, other students were sort of doing. And it, uh, that inspiration transcended uh, visual art at that time, you know. And I began to embrace uh, music in a different way. And, you know, where Questlove, my partner Questlove, the drummer in the Roots, and I sort of hit it off, um, you know, we connected over what we were able to you know, lend to one another. You know, I, you know, afforded him just a, a different musical education and that he had grown up in a musical family and was super familiar with jazz and spoken word and soul and funk and, you know, rock and roll and gospel. Um, but he, you know, didn't have the experience in the world of hip hop that I had, you know, and mine was, you know, hands on from sort of the, the mud. So, uh, you know, we were able to educate one another in that, and uh, yeah, you know, so we, now, now, now here I am. I think that's you know, where my trajectory sort of began and my interest in, again, you know, spoken word and, uh, you know, just different genres of music. My curiosity sort of began, began to peak. Yeah, you're very much an autodidact, right? I mean, you, you, you're, you're self-taught. I remember reading that you yeah. had like no furniture or TV in your apartment, just like oh, yeah, yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Like, um, yeah, I'm very thankful for the time I spent sort of, you know, unplugged and, you know, not necessarily off the grid, but, you know, just not, you know, really feeding into uh, the programming of that moment in time, which was, uh, you know, the, the early 90s. And, you know, I was able to really just, you know, fully immerse myself in, in uh, just, inspiration you know so yeah all I had in my apartment when I lived at 19th and Green and then uh, also over here at uh, on Broad Street at Broad and uh, Broad and Callahill I had a place too but yeah I just it was about having music and, and, and books and, and food <laughs> yeah. I am so jealous of that life like I, I wish yeah. that was my life no phone you know yeah. like you would have to reach me I would say you know, call this phone booth at this time. 
And you know, <laughs> if I'm there, you know, I'll be able to, I'll, I'll hear the phone ringing. So that's things. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Jane, what about you? Um, before you, I, you know, a lot of people in Philadelphia know you as this driving force of a powerful organization. They don't know how small and, and underdogged the organization is. But uh, I often say that you're, you're a, a, a leader of men and women with the soul of a poet. Um, what were your influences artistically that made you have this self-confidence to change the world? And by the way, let's give a shout out to the World Class Mural Arts Program. It is literally world class. 4,000, are we up to 4,000 murals? And we, just, and we just worked together on a mural of the late judge, federal judge, A. a Leon Higginbotham, who was a leading civil rights pioneer. And if you get a chance to look at it, it's at 46th and Chestnut, and Chestnut yeah. which we're really proud of. But, but where does this come from? Well, when I was young, my parents talked a lot about the murals created during the 1930s. So I remember looking at work, you know, um, Thomas Hart Benton, Ben Sean in particular was very political. Charles White was an incredible draftsperson. So I looked like, oh, art could, I thought, oh, art can serve a social purpose, like at a really young age, right? So that embedded in my brain. And then looking at the work of the Mexican muralists when I was in college, like just always intrigued by like, like the connection art could have on people. Um, that was interesting to me. But then when I got to LA, I worked for this incredible woman, uh, Judy Baca, who uh, actually has just had a show at the Getty and a few other museums. She's getting the recognition she deserves. And she was working with uh, young people in East LA and doing murals, and she ran the LA mural program. So she's the person I actually drove crazy. And she, when I got hired by the city, that Oliver Franklin had called her for a reference, because I said that, and he, she said, there are two things about Jane Golden, I'll tell you. And I was like, oh no, here it comes. He, she said, she will drive you crazy, and you should absolutely hire her. So I was like, <laughs> so, But she did this mural, you should look it up, everybody. It's called The Great Wall, it's in LA, it's a mile long, and it's the history of people of color in the state of California. And she just got a major Mellon grant to restore it and light it, and a whole, it'll have a whole educational component. And she was just fearless. She had so much courage, and she spoke truth to power in a way I had really never experienced. And you know, to be a young person just starting out and to have somebody like that as a role model, I was just like, just took my breath away. And then, you know, what happened was I was diagnosed with lupus. I was told I wouldn't live long. I ended up coming back here. I grew up in Margate, and I ended up coming to Philly and getting this job. And then I was inspired, quite frankly, by the graffiti writers. Yeah. I mean, by the, graf the graffiti art that I saw, and, and also by Basquiat, by Keith Haring, you know, and it informed Larry a, a sort of a thinking that, you know, like I love galleries and museums, but art doesn't have to be exclusively there. That that art should be everywhere. And that there was something so fresh about it mm. and, and really quite revolutionary, I thought. So I, I think, and then more recently, I'd say working on a project called Monument Lab with this awesome organization called Monument Lab, um, we worked with Hank Willis Thomas, who's one of my mm. favorite contemporary artists, and he did the Afro pick at MSB Plaza. And there were a lot of other really fascinating works of art, but that to me is interesting. Like, how do we continue to mine the creativity and talent that's out there? And I think, and, and put work, put art to work in public space, and for me, in about 2003 and four, I made the decision to not paint anymore because mural art started to grow. And I thought, you know, I'm an okay artist, but I could really support artists. Mm. I could really do that. And, and I've looked ever since at mural arts as a completely creative endeavor. Yeah. And so in a sense, it just shifted. So how can art do for a city what it did for both of you, which is, which is save you, and which is yeah. be a salve for trauma. You talked about being diagnosed with lupus. I, Tariq, I know your father was killed when you were young, your mother when you were in high school. Yeah. Uh, art is a, a way to deal with trauma. This is a city dealing with trauma. Yeah. What, what should we be doing, or, and what, how can art save we, we as a city, we should be investing in and you know supporting you know the arts and arts education and uh, and the youth you know more. 
um, you know, I think we should be more fearless in that. Jane was speaking about, you know, how she was uh, inspired by, you know, one woman's fearlessness. Um, and then, you know, I was inspired by her fearlessness. She was inspired by the fearlessness of, of us as, as, as young people, you know, running through the tunnels and hanging off the buildings and stuff. I think, you know, there's a certain level of, um, you know, abandon, you know what I mean, that, that, that we need to have in order to, you know, to fully uh, embrace the transformative, you know, value and potential of, of the arts. Philadelphia is, is the city of the arts in the way, you know, that, you know, you have, oh, this is the city of love or the city of lights or the city that never sleeps. Philadelphia is, you know, it's the city of brotherly love, but it's also the city of the arts. And that is uh, in a great, you know, great deal, of, you know, attributable to, to Jane and, and, and her efforts here. Um, so we need, we need to lean into that more because that art, these murals, I think, um, are our armor, you know? That's awesome. Uh, Jane, do you want to speak to that real quick? Yeah, I just want to say that I think that what art does is it humanizes us, it taps into our imagination, it allows us to think about our potential. And I think that what we do is we put art over here and we, we don't understand that it should be at the center. It could be integrated into, look at us, we work with the Department of Behavioral Health, criminal justice, education, you name it, environmental justice. Art is everywhere, and when you have an artist at the table, when you're talking about issues, even the big intractable ones, they are gonna see a pathway through. If I'm talking to Tariq for five minutes, I'm gonna come away from that conversation thinking about something else that we could be doing. And so I don't really understand it. I think it's a matter of being highly intentional. There are a thousand fabulous nonprofit arts organizations across the city. There are thousands of artists, and I feel privileged and honored that we employ 225 artists every year and pay them well and let them know that they have real value in our society. Imagine what Philly would be without the arts. Shut your eyes for a minute. It is a chilling notion, and so we have to push back and say, when I said non-negotiable before, it is non-negotiable. Yep. And the other thing they do, the arts, they highlight our distinction and our difference, and they underscore our commonality and our humanity, and we need that now more than ever. Uh, here, 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 here. And by the way, we have a speaker this afternoon coming from Chicago who, and what they're doing is embedding art in every city department. Yay. So that there's a, and she's gonna talk about that. So, so it's, it's, th that is an idea that this government can steal. Um, I wanna take one question from the audience. We're on a tight schedule, but um, before we do, Tariq, is Black No More coming back as, as Oh, a yeah, yeah, Black No More, uh, you know, a musical that uh, I wrote along with uh, the Oscar Award winner, uh, John Ridley and that um, I composed and arranged with uh, Anthony Tidd, uh, the musical director. John Ridley, who did 12 Years a Slave. Yeah, yeah, John Ridley, you know, of, of 12 Years uh, a Slave, uh, you know, fame. And Anthony Tidd of, you know, he's the MD over at the, the Kimmel Center. Um, but, yeah, and then I also, you know, I started in it. We had a, a beautiful off-Broadway run earlier this year. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll be back, uh, you know, on an even bigger stage, uh, hopefully, in a, uh, awesome. a, a, a year's time or so. When I when I talk about the way you play with blackness, that's what that's what this. <laughs> and there there's a, um, I will not do this justice, uh, but it, it, this is going to go on the back of my business card. If my body is my home and it's built of blood and bone and survives on, even thrives on love alone, it's not hard to understand how the measure of a man is to show more than the love that he's been shown. Yeah. Is that not the most beautiful thing? Uh, that, so, so props, man. And I'm, I, I, will you let us know when that's, when that's coming back? Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely, yes. Let's hear from uh, one lucky member of... of that's a question. One a a question. brief lucky member of the audience. Okay. <laughs> that person up there has a question. Hold on, I'll be right there. Man, you're like leaving the I'll room. Hold it. Okay. I'll hold it. Thank you. Sorry. I'll hold Sorry it. to make you walk. Um, lucky indeed. Uh, so I'm an educator, and I was thinking the other day about Black Lily. Oh. Um, and this like thing that you all planned that sort of turned into magic, right? And so I'm wondering, as somebody who is really, really interested in how do we create spaces that tap into and cultivate people's creativity and their agency and their sense of their best self, how much of that is like planning and vision? How much of that is just like 
a magical thing that happens and what lessons can we learn from an effort like that to cultivate this intentional, creative, human-centered space? Great yeah, question. I think, I think, you know, what happened at, you know, Black Lily, it was definitely um, a moment in time that we were able to sort of capture lightning in, in a bottle in that way. Um, but it was created, it's a platform that we created in response to, you know, a different platform that we created. You know, we wanted uh, to create a, a scene, you know, not only for hip hop, but just, you know, for live instrumentation and uh, for, you know, the musical improvisation, um, you know, sort of an upright citizens brigade of sorts, you know, for music. Um, at a time where the, there wasn't that you know big of a scene here in Philadelphia, so we went to New York City. Like you know, we took it to the sister city, you know, um, to sort of make our bones, and it evolved into uh, what became a legendary jam session, where you know, lots of MCs, artists, you know, of note, um, you know, anyone who was worth their salt in in the '90s made their way through uh, a venue called the wetlands i think where we you know ultimately you know landed and where where the the jam sessions were taking place but uh what happened was um you know female artists and vocalists and musicians felt uh shut out because because it was a uh, improv and you know there wasn't very much structure to the run of show um there would be lots of you know men and lots of masculine energy and just guys on stage sort of elbowing one another out of the way to to get to the microphone so we wanted to create something that spoke to that and that created a platform for, for female artists, uh, you know, to sort of shine and, and to get, you know, a little bit of that, a little, a little bit of that stage time. And that's what, you know, begat uh, the Black Lily, you know, those jam sessions that, you know, I think, you know, the first few that we had were in South Philly um, in a row home on St. Alvin's Place, uh, you know, where Quest and, you know, some other members of our collective uh, used to live. And then we found our way to, uh, I want to say uh, the five spot um, right. down off of Market Street, uh, but yeah, you know, lots of people people sort of rose through the ranks. And Jasmine Sullivan, when she was 11 or 12 years old, you know, we would sneak her in the back door, and she would <laughs> sing. And then we'd sneak her out, and you know, Jill Scott and Erica Badu and Common, and I mean, everybody sort of pulled up to the Black Lily at that time. I remember uh, John Legend was a student at, uh, at UPenn during that time, and he would get turned away all the time. Like, <laughs> like I, had an, I had an assistant who, uh, her name was Rachel Gonza at the time, um, before you know, she was married, and she's a, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner now, but she was my personal assistant, and she was in charge of the door. And she was also at UPenn. And I don't know what it was that she had against John Legend, but <laughs> you know, I always like, nah, he's not getting in. Uh, so yeah, he was never able to sort of, you know, to, to, to rise through the Black Lily uh, ranks. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it had a lot to do with, uh, you know, just place and time and what was sort of going on. Um, you know, Adam Blackstone, uh, who is a, a brilliant bassist and, you know, composer, arranger, um, musical director for most of the award shows that you see on TV now. Um, he was just, he was the musical guest on Tonight Show just a week ago, and I performed with him. He's now Grammy nominated for his first solo album, which is nominated for, I think, the best jazz album, uh, you know, for these, these upcoming Grammy Awards. He started a new thing um, called Producer Sessions or something. He started like his version of The Black Lily, but in LA because that's where, uh, you know, he had been based for quite some time um, as the band for another one of Jimmy Fallon's shows called uh, That's My Jam. But, um, you know, what happened with the Black Lily is we were able to reestablish, you know, like we set a precedent and we sort of reestablished the bar for live instrumentation um, just in the world. So you know, really anyone who you see from Jay-Z to Janet Jackson to Mariah Carey, I mean, you name it, anyone who's out there touring, doing shows, with live musicians, most of those musicians are from Philadelphia. And that is because of the Black Lily, you know? And these are people who have been able to go on and make, you know, names for themselves as musical directors and composers, arrangers, and, you know, DJs, and, you know, just, you know, every level of instrumentation. So uh, the Black Lily definitely lives on, and I think that idea definitely lives on. And in order for it 
to, uh, to happen again and to you know, continue to be a thing that lives on here in the city of Philadelphia. All it needs is the space for the platform to exist. That's awesome. Um, so I, I like to call myself a recovering journalist, but, but years ago, 20 years ago, when I was a cynical journalist, I met Jane Golden, and she was talking about how art saves lives, and I was like, how does throwing some paint on a wall save, save anyone's lives? Who, who is this person? <laughs> and I just want to end by thanking you both and, and saying that you convinced me that, and in fact, that you both have sa are saving lives. Uh -huh. uh, you are, you are frontline workers in the, in the fight for democracy and freedom. So I'm really grateful for, for both of you for being here and sharing your brilliance with us. So on behalf of Philadelphia, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much.